All right. I think we're live. Are we live? Great. Um, welcome, everyone. This is the uh, inaugural event of the Future of Iran Initiative at the Atlantic Council. I'm Barbara Slavin. I'm the acting director of this initiative, which builds on the work we've done for the last five years with our Iran task force. Uh, and I'm really thrilled about this event. This is something I've wanted to do for the longest time, but it was complicated to, to get everybody here. Um, this is about people-to-people -people exchanges with Iran and how important they are as we try to rebuild a relationship that's been broken for over three decades. Um, one of my favorite uh, memories uh, in going to Iran came in 1998. I was lucky enough to be there when the first American athletes to officially compete in Iran arrived. They were a group of wrestlers. And they competed in something called the Takti Cup. And uh, I will never forget what it was like to hear the Iranian fans, mind you, this is not even 20 years after the revolution, to hear the Iranian fans chant, scream, applaud for the American wrestlers when they came in and when they competed. And they even applauded for them when they beat the Iranians, which happened on at least one occasion. There were also, there was an American flag flying in Azadi Stadium, and it was the first time I'd seen an American flag flying there that wasn't being burned in an anti-US demonstration. It was extraordinary. I mean, the Americans in the audience, the, the tears were just streaming down our face. So that was incredible. Then we went into somewhat of a dark period under Ahmadinejad. Um, but things are returning to the way they were, and hopefully uh, will we'll advance beyond that. So we're going to talk about sports diplomacy. We're going to talk about uh, what's known as cultural diplomacy. And we have a stellar group. We're going to start. Um, I, I should say, though, we don't have an actual wrestler with us. We're going to watch some film. The US wrestling team is in, well, well. current wrestler. <laughs> we have some in the audience. They can come up and demonstrate moves if they want. <laughs> um, the, the, the team is currently in Hungary. So we, we could not pull them away from that. But we do have some, some footage. And, and uh, we have folks who've been in Iran and who've, who've been instrumental in having this happen. First, we have Greg Sullivan. Uh, Greg is Senior Advisor for Strategic Communications and Public Diplomacy in the State Department's Office of Iranian Affairs. Uh, he has really been instrumental in, in uh, ramping up this program since he joined the office in 2011. He directed the launch of something called the Virtual US Embassy Tehran. And he's overseen the expansion of US government-sponsored people-to-people exchanges with Iran in sports, arts, culture, and education. Uh, Greg previously served as Director of Press and Public Diplomacy for the Bureau of South and Central Asian Affairs. He was also spokesman for the State Department's Bureau of Near Eastern Affairs after 9-11 and during the Iraq War. And that's when I got to know him in my capacity as, as a journalist. He's also served in Bahrain, Egypt, and South Africa. And he has degrees in economics and European history from Brown, and a master's focusing on the Middle East and Islamic studies from the University of Virginia. Next, we're going to have Bachman Bakhtiari. He's executive director of the International Foundation for Civil Society, which is an organization that explores fundamental social and political shifts in the Middle East and North Africa and focuses on bridging cultural gaps and, and uh, fostering a discourse of understanding. I've known Bachman also more than 20 years. He has a distinguished academic career. He's the author of dozens of articles and publications, including Sports Diplomacy with Iran, Breaking Barriers, Bridging Differences. And then we'll have uh, Christina Kiki Kelly, who is the team leader for US men's Greco-Roman wrestling for this Olympic cycle. She's the first woman to serve in that position. And she's also the first woman to represent uh, a country in formerly all male wrestling venues in Iran, which she has visited twice. Uh, during her visit, she served as a goodwill ambassador. She participated in high-level meetings and helped draft documents on furthering US-Iran relations through sports diplomacy, as well as supporting the first women's belt wrestling team in Iran. I'm going to ask you to tell me about that. Um, she's had a successful business career at IBM and Google and also established the Kima Private Foundation, which supports programs at Carleton College, funds the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum's Urban Gardening and Public Policy Programs, and you've also 
built the technology and science building for a Tanzania secondary school, as well as providing scholarships for Tanzanian girls and non-traditional students of promise. Um, and then finally, Jim Ravenack, who has been president of USA Wrestling, the national governing body of amateur wrestling in the United States since 2006. He served as team leader of the 2004 US Olympic team for freestyle wrestling and for other US international teams. He's been USA Wrestling State chairperson in Louisiana since 1996 and was named 2001 Man of the Year by USA Wrestling, was inducted in 2005 by the National Wrestling Hall of Fame. He's a former uh, state wrestling champion in high school and college, and he built and organized a USA Wrestling Regional Olympic Training Center in Louisiana. And he's also a successful businessman in the offshore oil industry. Um, so this is a great, great group of people and very, very knowledgeable about this issue. Um, I'm going to start with Greg to give us some history of uh, U.S.-Iran cultural diplomacy sure. uh, as seen from the State Department. So sure. go. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Barbara. And I just want to say, too, um, uh, we've all been working together the, the past few years, uh, James, Kiki, Bachman. We've known each other for years now. And this has just been a wonderful story of government and American civil society working co collaboratively towards a very worthwhile goal which is improving the environment between the American and Iranian people. Um, it just, um, you know, taking a few minutes just to, to, to put it all in perspective. We are at a very historic opportunity right now. This is probably uh, the, the most historic turning point in U.S.-Iran relations in the past uh, uh, 40 years. Um, we've seen the successful signing of the JCPOA, also known as the Nuclear Agreement. Um, and we've seen the arrival of Implementation Day which uh, those outside the Beltway means uh, the US and Iran have successfully implemented the, uh, the initial obligations under that nuclear agreement. So it means we're, we're in good standing in terms of that, that agreement that we signed. Um, and uh, uh, together, it means that the US, Iran, the international community have taken a dramatic step forward in reversing the 36 plus years of animosity and bad blood between us. Um, and actually taking a very positive step in the direction of building a new relationship, um, what could be a new relationship based on mutual respect and, uh, uh, and, and collaboration. So, um, you know, truly wonderful uh, era of opportunity that we've entered here. And sports diplomacy played a critical role in nurturing an environment where new messages, new rhetoric, um, respectful language, could be heard. It, it helped clear away the debris of 36 years of bad rhetoric, dehumanizing behavior. Um, sports diplomacy put it, basically cleared the way for uh, a new dialogue to be heard, new words and new messages of goodwill to be received and, and taken for what they were. Um, and just, um, I won't take much more, but I just want to say, you know, this, this all began really with um, uh, President Obama signaling to, to us at the State Department and around the international community that he wanted a new relationship with the Islamic community when he spoke uh, at Cairo University uh, and delivered his address to the Islamic community, signaling that he wanted a new relationship. We at the Iran desk said, this is our opportunity. So we did something rare in Washington. We engage in a period of introspection. You know, um, we don't do enough of that. Um, but we did take a step back, and we, we, we talked to others in the international community um, at, at, with the view of, of uh, uncovering, was our policy working? Uh, were we having the intended effect? And most importantly, were we being heard the way we wanted to be heard inside of Iran? We claimed uh, to have a two-track policy. Two-track meaning, of course, carrot and stick. That you used punitive measures like sanctions and diplomatic isolation, uh, uh, to, uh, to deter the kind of behavior that you don't want to see, but that you were using an outstretched hand of, uh, you know, of exchanges and goodwill um, that would reinforce the positive behaviors that you wanted to see. Uh, as we engaged in this period of introspection, we decided um, we were far too heavily weighted on the punitive side, that um, we were not giving a sufficient message of hope and what we would call light at the end of the tunnel to the Iranian people and to those in Iran that, that would be inclined to work collaboratively with us. So um, 
uh, backed by the administration, really goaded on by the administration, uh, we began to restore uh, our, our public diplomacy programs. We restored our uh, student advising programs in the Persian language, attracting Iranian students here. Uh, we restored our exchange programs in education, arts, culture, and sports. Um, and, then, uh, and then we started to talk more broadly with the international community about what we could do. Uh, again, backed by, the, uh, backed by the administration, we got Treasury to issue a general license um, that authorized uh, third parties here in the United States, uh, private citizens, to engage in exchanges in arts, culture, sports, and education. Um, and then we worked with uh, the visa issuing operations and Department of Homeland Security to liberalize visa issuing and streamline visa, is visa issuing procedures so that those who would participate in those exchanges could actually get here, you know, without a, with a minimum of difficulty. Um, and it created an environment where um, uh, uh, it, these activities could go forward. The next step was reaching out to these visionaries, you know, people who had been wanting this for years, um, but were limited by this punitive mm -hmm. uh, uh, sanctions administration that we had put in place over the course of 35 years. And that's where our weakness, we haven't been in Iran. We, a State Department representative hasn't been in Iran since 1980. Um, we don't have the contacts. We don't, we don't have an embassy on the ground, but they do. And so it was a perfect marriage, really. We, we signaled that we were here to help, uh, that we were now, our new job on the Iran desk was to help uh, pave the way for their good intentions, and they ran with it. Um, they set up these exchanges, they, they reached out to participants in Iran and built these relations, uh, and you know, the rest is history, as you'll see. But um, very proud of what, uh, what we've been able to do at the Iran desk in, in creating a more positive environment. And um, you know these, uh, the, the, you know these great people up here too, you know implementing these programs, building new relationships. We heard over, and the final thing I wanted to say is we heard throughout this process, um, uh, as as Secretary Kerry talked to Foreign Minister Zarif, as Wendy Sherman engaged with his uh, her counterparts, um, we heard repeatedly that um, sports diplomacy, that these arts and cultural exchanges, wrestling uh, came up, volleyball, the volleyball exchange that we did in, in uh, the summer of 2014. <clears throat> these repeatedly came up as, uh, 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 you know, as, and taken for what they were, goodwill gestures, shows of respect to Iran and its legitimate accomplishments. Yeah. Um, and uh, it really did reinforce what we were trying to do. They played a powerful role as a confidence building measure and paving the way for a discussion that could be based on respect and, and co cooperation. You've used and the word, that? yeah, you've used the word respect a number of times, and I think yeah. that is perhaps the most important word you can use when you're dealing with Iran. And I wanted to quote something that uh, Secretary Kerry uh, said in an interview with uh, my friend David Rennie of The Economist. He was talking about the return of looted uh, uh, artifacts from Cambodia, but he said, to show respect for a country and its culture can be, quote, an important part of diplomacy. And uh, there are Iranians in this room who know very well that wrestling is uh, a sport that is taken more seriously in Iran, perhaps, yeah. than it is in the United States. It's an ancient, ancient sport, and the Iranians are really good at it. And so to pick a sport in which Iranians excel is a way of showing, uh, is showing uh, respect for Iranian culture. I'm going to turn now to Bachman. I mm -hmm. think you're going to show us some uh, photographs. Sure, uh, sure. And, uh, and uh, also a video. Okay. Um, Again, for those who, mm -hmm. who haven't had the pleasure of being in Iran and, and seeing the way American athletes are, yes. are greeted, it's pretty incredible. So, Bachman, mm -hmm. why don't you, if you can see from here, why don't you yes. tell us what we're looking at? There, there's Kiki. Yeah. In um, May 2014, uh, the World Cup of Greco-Roman wrestling was held in Tehran, and U.S. team qualified to participate in that cup. So U.S. team, represented by Jim Ravanak, president, and Kiki, and I accompany the team as assistant to Jim, both of them. And we went to Iran, and it was a kind of a surprise to the Iranians when Kiki arrived, <laughs> and, uh, because wrestling is a very male-dominated sport in Iran, and although they have belt wrestling for women right now, there's a lot of Islamic values, cultures, that is really... Can I set the stage? Yes. Because when they submitted my name for a visa, they mm. said, isn't this a female? Because it's Christina. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. And, um, and uh, mm. Coach Frazier at the time said, yes, it is. And, and so he called me immediately and said, there's a very, very, very strong chance you won't be allowed to go. And even if you do go, 
you will not be allowed into any of the arenas. They have not, women are not allowed there, not even mothers, sisters, whatever. And I said I would still like to go, even if I stood outside of the arena, because I thought it was important. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, so I think with Kiki's determination, and <laughs> um, maybe kind of, uh, in a way, there's so much uh, limitations on women and sports in Iran that has really been fighting a lot in volleyball stadium. Women are very active in getting the women allowed into the stadium. In wrestling too, with all uh, um, acknowledgement of the new president of Iran's wrestling, Rasul Khadam, he has started a movement toward getting the women more involved. The, uh, several of his uh, officials, administrators are women. So when Kiki arrived in Iran, um, it was a surprise to the audience <laughs> because the audience was not expecting uh, such an arrival. And so that's the first thing was happened that uh, then Jim asked her to carry the sign in the stadium, in the arena, which was there quite a task. Approximately 6,000 yeah. or more men. And it, it didn't occur to me that it was men, only men. <laughs> only men. <laughs> and I was literally the only woman until yes. I was walking around the mats. Right. So this is a picture taken by the Iranian Wrestling Federation of us waiting in the line before walking toward the this arena. Yes. Huh? This was the second day. Mm -hmm. It's the second day, yes. But they, they did yeah. call us, they contacted, and, and really didn't want Kiki to, to do the opening ceremony. Right. And, um, and, and so through my representation with the counterpart in Iran, he said, if, if Kiki can't do this as part of the team leader that you agreed upon, and this was agreed upon before the event started, was the U.S. team was going to pull out. And so then they came back and said well, she could do it, but Bauman and myself had to accompany her. So. <laughs> it's an Iranian solution. I have, to, I have to take responsibility for it. <laughs> and I happen to have packed a red, white, red, white, and blue hijabs. Yeah. yeah. Well, just done. in case. Well but done. With all, uh, I mean, I think we go back to the respect. I think most important there was that it's not a question of women being stadium. It's the question of respecting the status of women. And I think obviously, if Kiki has showed up dressed up very liberal with her scarf and everything, they probably would have raised some issues. But Kiki really showed up very respected, very conservative. Mm -hmm. And this way, we talk about how spaces in Iran always are negotiated depending on how much respect, how much dignity one can put up. And the, the Iranian Wrestling Federation really could not object to that presence. And so uh, after that, Lidi got to march with the team's uh, sign, USA. And to me, it was interesting that is USA, to go back a little bit, is USA, Turkey, and is that Russia? Russia. Russia. So all strong allies of the United States right in front, <laughs> in Iran, <laughs> axis of evil. Yeah, well, I didn't Russia. <laughs> so, there, were, there were forces at work there that were also, because the first barrier to entry was the House of Wrestling in Tehran. No woman has entered that for right. 33 years. That was the very first day it was meetings I dressed from head to toe in black and expected to be, again, outside the building. But I was invited to into the room. And then once there, I think they, were, they thought, well, oh, modest woman. Um, and they offered me a seat at the table. And I would have been happy with just that, a seat at the table. Um, but, be, and then Motoshe uh, Keram, learning Manfarsum Kubnist, just little tiny things like that, you know, and um, made all the difference. Yes, that's great. So we go next to the next picture. OK. Now, uh, that's Robbie Smith, the American wrestler. And that's the Iranian fan wearing a USA shirt. One of the amazing things that happened during this tournament was that Jim's presence really provided a lot of serious uh, presence for US team. As a president of USA Wrestling, I think this was Jim's first trip to Iran since the revolution. So by being there, there were things done that could not have been done otherwise if the president of the Real Celestine was not, not happened to be present. So during the whole ceremony, all these fans keep chanting USA, USA, USA. And it was really amazing how much they loud. And even they called your name. They called Kiki's name. And Kiki was not the same. So where's my name coming this from? This was the first day, and they had me behind glass in the VIP section. So I said, no, that must be a Farsi word. And, which, and then they, I, he said, yeah. stand up. And they I went like this, and they went, yay! They went and then I went, like, <laughs> so the Iranian fans are really interesting because Iranian fans follow the sport of wrestling. They follow who's the wrestler, what is the record, what are the chances. I mean, it's similar, not that different than NFL 
politics in this, uh, football in this country, where Americans follow the teams. So during that time, uh, the crowd was really supportive of Robbie. Robbie drove the crowd crazy with his signs. This is the heavy, our heavy well, he was heavyweight. He was the wrestler. Right. He was the drummer. He was the drummer. Right. And the gentleman went to, he was a drummer. So Jim went down and said, I'm going to go give the drummer a USA shirt. And the drummer gave an Iranian shirt to the American. And then two, they just took the shirt, changed it. They went around the auditorium. The crowd went just crazy. Because this was the first, in my experience, I've been to Iran a lot. I've done a lot of work on Iranian parliament, research and travel. This was the first time I had seen in 36 years such a symbolic expression of US Iran so open with TV, media, and everybody. And the crowd is simply going crazy as if the, the two countries have never broken relationship with them. So that is a very important historical development at that time. It I just shows. Want to say, we were tracking all this in yes. the Department of State, you know, just almost incredulously, uh, <laughs> with re you know reports going all the way up to our seventh floor, you know, the, 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 our front office, yeah. you know, explaining this. This is real. This, this is, is real. unprecedented, yeah. um, and uh, it really shows uh, um, an opportunity here uh, mm -hmm. to change the narrative with Absolutely. the Iranian people. Absolutely. And I think, uh, again, with Jim's presence, again, it's very important because such yeah. a high official went to Iran. And in Iran, everything is hierarchical, as you know. The participation of the president of USA Wrestling means a lot when uh, he comes to Iran. Mm -hmm. So he can do things, crowd will respond, and so forth. So go to the next picture. OK, now that's Robbie. Uh, he is. You can notice the crowd clapping hands for him. He returns by clapping for the crowd. Now, is this the one where he was losing to the Russian? Yes. OK, because th this is an incredible story. It's an incredible story. He was losing to a Russian, and uh, there was an Iranian drummer who yeah. was drumming. And well, the Russian was taking a break. Yeah, taking a break. <laughs> and, taking a break. And, and I'm and, thinking, well, we're just going to get beat by the Russian again. And then the drummer <laughs> started chanting. And Robbie started hitting his hitting chest. Hitting his chest, chest like this. And then it was right? like, it got louder and louder. And then it was like, uh-oh. You know, we, but remember yeah. now, there are several mats on the floor. Right. There are other wrestlers on it's this side. It's a dual meet. So this, and there's this is one mat on this side. And the wrestlers on that side were really wondering what is going on. Because they couldn't really connect to the whole right. noise and everything. Anyway, you guys tell what happened. I mean, he was losing. And, and then he started to he win, started right? He started to win. He got excited with the crowd, the motivation of the crowd. And the crowd also went crazy when they saw the impact they have on Robbie. Yeah. So they started sending his name. I mean, Robbie, in Persian, when Robbie, they want to say Smith, Robbie. they kind of say S. Smith, S. Smith, because in, in Farsi language, we have a problem with S. We just say E.S. So it's, they kept saying S. Smith, S. Smith, S. Smith. And, yeah. and so it was the first time again that I heard the chanting of an American athlete's name mm -hmm. so loudly. So, and we have a, you, it's a video, right? Yes. OK, so you can see what happened. If you would play. Let's see. We can make it a whole screen and play it. Can you see? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's when he didn't get up. S. Smith, S. Smith. You can hear S. Smith, S. Smith. And you can hear Robbie, too. Robbie. S. Smith. Robbie. Look at his socks, by the way. Yeah, the He's socks are US flags. US flag socks. I think that's a nice touch. By the way, people had crawled in to get into this arena through the windows and the gates. Yeah. When, when we arrived, it was rather tense because all these people wanted to get into the arena, and so our car mm -hmm. was surrounded by four out. police cars. They had to held us out until they cleared a path so that we could get through. So through, I think through soldiers. <laughs> right. It is. A, it was an interesting experience, uh, in a way that. Uh, the, this visit was just more than wrestling now. Yes. First, it turned into a people-to-people -people exchange. The media came after Kiki a lot for interviews. Immediately after this, she got received hundreds of requests for interviews. Uh, the deputy minister of sports invited us to a restaurant. And it was the <laughs> first time that such a high-level official was invited for a dinner. And I remember in that restaurant, I was translating and he kept saying, has Miss Kiki seen the Iranian parliament? And I said, no, he hasn't seen it. So I was trying not to get too much work for myself. Right. So, and he said, well, you should take her to the Iranian parliament. So I said, sure, we take her to the Iranian parliament. And then he said, has she been to Esfahan? I said, no, she has not been to Esfahan. No, 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 so, no. In the very first interview, OK, so I think we'll the, switch to you, Kiki. Yes. Why don't you take yeah. it up from At here? the House <laughs> of Wrestling, which was the big deal, and I'm wearing all black. Um, which is important because I looked more conservative than any Iranian woman because <laughs> I was completely deluded. Of course, with what we hear about Iran, 
you know, I'm from Minnesota, which is which has a, a high proportion of um, of Muslims, but most are from uh, not a Shia but a Sunni background. So I had a Somali woman help me go to a local store and, and buy clothes, which happened to be way more conservative than the Iranian women <laughs> wear. So, but but so when I was offered a seat at the table during this day, and we had translation, and I was just sitting there doing my work um, because I, I, that's what I do um, from Minnesota. Um, at the end of it, it was a student group, the ISNA, Iranian Student News uh, Association, and they just said, can we, can we ask you a couple questions? And I knew they were kids, and I thought, well, what's the harm in that? You know, they just so, so I, I went to a little corner with them, and they just said, why are you wearing that? <laughs> and, <laughs> and I said, well. I asked you the same thing. But. <laughs> I said, I wanted to show respect. Yep. Mm. And I said, um, where I come from, Minnesota, there are, are many um, Muslim people, and I'm very excited to be here. I would love to come back again with my family. I would love, it's a beautiful, I mean, I had just already had had a wonderful, warm, open, you know, experience, and and I was working on my Farsi, and it was just, it was wonderful. So um, that apparently translated into, by that night, it went to the official news organization on television. The next morning, there was a headline with my picture that said, Modest American Woman. <laughs> 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 Only in Iran can you be famous for that. <laughs> and uh, that was kind of the entree to a whole bunch of things. And so by the time um, they, they, they were trying to please me, they said I, she wanted to go to Isfahan. So um, after everyone was leaving, um, I was asked to stay an extra, an extra six days to visit Isfahan and parliament and a girls' school and an orphanage and a house of wrestling. Um, and that was very interesting to tell my family. I am staying another six days while my team is leaving. I'm staying in Iran. <laughs> Great idea. Um, I wanted to ask you also you, uh, about if you could tell us uh, what women's belt wrestling is, because apparently this is something that is allowed in Iran for women. So how, how does it, I mean, so what does on it look my, like? On my first trip, there was absolutely no um, way that women were even going to be allowed into any arena, much less wrestle. Um, however, I became very close friends with um, several sports ministry families, among them Razul Kadem, who is the um, President of the Federation. President of the Federation, but he's also the head coach for free, freestyle. And um, his brother, Amir Kadem, and both of them had wrestled. I ended up um, becoming friends with Amir's wife and going to their home for dinner. And these type of things are make huge difference, yeah, huge, huge difference. difference. So um, we started talking. Razul said, um, I ran into him actually in Tashkent, which was a few months later. And World Championships, and he said, he said, K -k -k -k, come here, you know, which is unusual in and of itself to have a, a high level ranking Iranian asking, you know, a, and I had been treated terribly in Tashkent actually. Everything about Uzbekistan was what I had thought would happen to me in, in Iran, and it was totally opposite. Hmm. So, um, Interesting. he said, What if I told you in a year we'll have women wrestling? And I, I did this, wow. you know, I said, if, and he said, if, if I do this, will you be part of it? And I said, of course I will. I will bring, I will bring, yes, I will make it happen. And he's good on his word and I'm good on my word. So before, um, he said, but you must come to the Takti Cup. So I basically threatened to quit my job because at the time it, Takti wasn't on our list of places to go and I said, I must bring a team. So they gave me three wrestlers at the last second and we went to all the way to Kirmanshah, which is on the border of Iraq. And uh, it was the first time I think that any American team had been outside of Tehran. So we went on a nine hour journey into a very interesting place and I wasn't sure how the Kurdish uh, Iranians would, would respond to us, but I would be embraced. I was well known in the, in the bazaars. It was it was crazy. Um, treated wonderfully there. There was no problem whatsoever, no problems getting into the building. And they were so incredibly impressed that we had honored, we were honoring their national figure, their sports figure, Takti. And so that was, again, another coup. So, so what exactly is belt wrestling? I mean, right. So um, I said, how are we going to get around the, the uniform? Yeah. Um, and we had talked about judo, about how women were allowed to do some judo, and, and if we could have some sort of um, swim, you know, their swimwear 
covers everything. So as long as you basically cover your tail end and your, your hair, for the most part, you're OK. So mm -hmm. um, he said, well, one of the reasons I wanted you to come to Takti is so you could see Palavani wrestling, which is our, our uh, original wrestling. And it's belt wrestling. Hmm. So you grab each other yeah. by the belt. They, right. they, they grab to pull each other, each other by down. the belt, yes. Oh, they grab each okay. other by the belt. Right, so this is step, this is step one. Mm -hmm. we're, we're taking the long view. The Persians, which they call themselves the Persians, take, are very patient people. And they're taking the long view. And this is just step by step by step by step. And so um, this past summer, I was all set to take um, two young Beat the Streets girls um, and several of our women's team members, top ranked, to go and, and do this belt wrestling exposition. Unfortunately, there was a printing error in our visas, and we, were, we had to cancel the trip. So we did not go, but that is still yeah. on the docket. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. But let me uh, uh, also explain, I think another fascinating thing with this thing was because of Titi's involvement, the public media, the reaction of people on the street was fascinating because we took the American team to Iranian Bazaar sure. for shopping. And uh, when the American team arrived in Iranian Bazaar, everybody recognized them. Sure. They were opening the door. We went to this carpet store, and the gentleman in the carpet store came and said, I love America so much, I'm going to give one carpet to each member of the American team. Have them go select one, anything they want. And there's something in Persian called tarof, yeah. which means you say things, but you're not supposed to accept it, <laughs> and so forth like that. So American teams, being very good American, they didn't understand tarof, so they start picking the most expensive carpets on the wall. And you told them, you, yeah. Yeah, so I began telling them, no, no, said, those are really expensive. But, but the fact was, this gentleman actually gave a free carpet to uh, each yeah. American team. Yeah. And Dave Kirby, which was a Greco Roman wrestler before the Kirby Cup, and so he was there, a gentleman came and gave him a huge cup with carpet around it, and everybody said, You cannot take it to the airport. He said, No, I'll take it. So he went to the airport, he grabbed the cup all the way from Tehran to America, sitting on the seat like that. <laughs> and it, it really shows how much public diplomacy pays if sure. it's done in such a respectful way, because Kiki came across so respectful, it began to have a spread effect in everywhere. Everybody wanted to do something. The hotel the Americans were to, staying at. I, had to come, they, I came back with three extra suitcases. Yes. <laughs> it was amazing. So it's it amazing. is a, uh, Iranians in gift giving is very important tradition in Iran. They give a lot of gifts and so forth like that. And uh, when the Iranian team comes to LA now, they bring gifts all the time for the American well, team. Well, we made sure. So when we went to talk to you, we brought lots and lots of gifts. You know, again, and my Farsi improved enough for me to say man farsim kubnis, which is my Farsi is not that great. Um, but they loved that. Ha ha ha. Yeah, they thought it was funny and stuff. And we started to get to know people. And I really, they, they love Seinfeld. <laughs> and they love laughing, and for, love for, they loved felt. being around us. They, they, everyone would volunteer to be with us, even on a, like a stupid minivan on a nine hour, because they loved laughing. And I, and I said, do you have comedians here? And they didn't skip a beat. And the guy said, no, but we have depression cafes. <laughs> and we so, all so laughed. I want to ask you one more question, and that is how you got involved in wrestling to begin with, how you became a team leader, which most which is unusual, yeah. Yeah. Is yeah, it from it your is. family, from a history of wrestling in your family, or? It's the, uh, okay, so first of all, it goes back to the Olympics. Um, of the Olympic sports, I was, I mean, I was a classical languages and literature major, and so m the marathon and Greco-Roman wrestling were very interesting to me, plus I'm, I'm a super fan for the Olympics. I've never missed a single, a single Olympics. and. You know, Adam Wheeler comes from my part of the country. Minnesota is known for Greco-Roman wrestling. Um, my brother was a wrestler. My dad was a wrestler. Okay. I probably should have been a wrestler. I'm a little too old to even have broken that barrier. But um, I have. I played rugby and swimming. And if you put them all together, it'd make me a good wrestler. In fact, I compete against the women in plank. Um, it's between me and Yelena right now, and I'm beating her at 19 minutes. So, <laughs> okay. I, I should also add that I learned what Greco-Roman wrestling is, which is you're only allowed to use the upper part upper of your body, mm -hmm. um, not, and you can't use your legs. So that makes it makes it even harder. Um, mm -hmm. Jim, uh, I remember uh, interviewing you when you came back, I think, from your, your first trip to Iran. 
and you were talking about how you, people would ask you how it went, and you would tell them you had a fabulous time. And you said, people looked at me like I had two heads. Um, <laughs> so, Still do. <laughs> uh, if you try to, yeah, well, I, I tell people I hope I'm going to Iran for the elections, and they, they look at me with concern, you know, and say, are you sure? It's OK. Um, uh, talk about a little bit about, about your experiences there, but also what you hope to accomplish for the future in terms of joint projects with Iranian wrestling? Well, I mean, it's just, you know, certainly an honor that, you know, given to me to lead the teams in and, you know, going in as far as, you know, the uh, my counterpart with Rasul, you know, the wrestling being probably is, is their football to our football. And, um, you know, we, I was counting on the way back, I've been over 30 countries with teams. And, and Tehran has got, is, is in the top two or three cities that I've been to that just fabulous as far as the embracing that they do to you, the, you know, the, the culture, you know, just totally opposite of what you think. Even calling my wife, she said, how, how bad is it? I said, bad, it's a really great time. <laughs> <laughs> Not bad at all. You know, you, get, you got Bauman and you got the superstar Kiki, so everything's going fine. But, um, and everyone was on Facebook, so. You know, get, getting there in the, mid, you know, in the middle of the night, they were there to greet us. And they knew who I was. I mean, you know, everybody knew. Uh, you know, it, it's intimidating probably for the first 24 hours. And after that, you know, I mean, I felt comfortable walking around. Bauman didn't want me to stray and go to things that I wanted to do. But the most important thing that I probably did was, was, was sign the agreement with Rasul as far as the cultural exchanges for our kids. But I wanted, you know, raising so many underprivileged children. I wanted to go see their inner city projects. And uh, that's where so all of their Tehran. great wrestlers come from. Mm -hmm. And it's where a lot of the great wrestlers beat our wrestlers. So, and, and Bauman's in the car, says, you don't need to go to the gym. I said, I'm going, Bauman. This is one of my whole trip. And they let, we were late. We were about an hour late. The whole kids team was there. Their families were there. They were they lined up, hundreds of them. We got there, and then, and, and, Five or six Olympic champions there. It's a very, very poor part of Tehran, southern Tehran. And families just bring the wrestlers and put them in the clinic, hoping that they will become stars. Mm -hmm. So when they heard Jim is coming as an American, they got so excited, and they all went ahead and put their best uniform yeah. on. Mm -hmm. And they came in front of you, remember? Well, they, they, they did practice, a complete but, you know, uh, The main thing was I wanted to see, you know, it's no different than what we do. Right. You know, and, and to show them that we're no different than they are. And uh, each of them had a practice for us, and for Rasul and myself, and then all of their big stars. I mean, guys yeah, that you know, we, you know, we would love to have them coach our teams were there. And I said, I said, I said Bauman, this is where they trained. This is where they learned right here. <coughs> so which was very important to me to mm -hmm. be a part of. <coughs> and what are the plans going forward for, uh, for continuing this? Well, I, I was just flew in from Brazil, but I had some correspondence with uh, Rasul and um, you know we're working on getting our cadets which is our high school level age group teams to go uh, problem is with with a high school kid that's under a junior you know with certain times of the year we can only go mm -hmm. and it's opposite of this we're trying to figure it out um, mm -hmm. this year being Olympic year I think we're gonna do some more he'll you know the Iran you know we're gonna do um, quite a few with our younger kids and I'm emphasizing him to bring some some cadet level kids, which is our 15, 16 year olds, with him to the World Cup, mm -hmm. maybe cross train with some of our kids in California. Where's the, where's the World Cup this year? Los Angeles. It's in, and when is that? It's in June, I'm not June sure. June 11 and 12. L yeah, 11 and 12. In LA. So, they, um, so they'll be in, I think he's gonna stay an extra week for us. But being an Olympic year, it, it's, it gets a little dicey too, so. Mm -hmm. um, However, uh, we, we are potentially being included in, in Tehran's World Cup, so I might be going with the... This with coming the, May. Yes, yeah, this Greco May. Right. May 2016. Yes. We're waiting to see what teams want to... to it could be a repeat of that and, trip. And, and, and also we should point out, I, I, I don't know how many of you know, that uh, wrestling was almost dropped from the Olympics. Yeah. That's right. Uh, and if not for the U.S.-Iran-Russia, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. interesting combination, uh, mm -hmm. working together, uh, it, it would have been dropped. And now I think it's, it's in to stay through at least 2024. Um, yeah, there's there's no more uh, core and non-core. You know, it's just the right. sport's the sport, and the only way they'll come at you now is if they want to remove you or remove a discipline of the sport. But we're we're safe for 
however long. Yeah. Just yeah. A, a quick note on that. It was uh, such wonderful cooperation. That, that threat of losing wrestling in the Olympics inspired the, the U.S., the Russian, and the American team to come together. They did an event called Rumble on the Rails right, at and, Grand and Central St Station in New York, yeah. uh, where the Iranian team uh, came uh, in. Madison, uh, Madison Square Garden, right. I think. Yeah. Madison no. Square Garden. No, well, uh, it, Grand Central. It was in a Grand Central. Central. Yeah. In the, in the That's why it was itself. Rumble on the Rails. Oh, yeah, because they, they used the Great Hall okay. at, uh, at Grand Central Station. Wow. And, uh, uh, and yeah, and so and it was a wonderful optic because you had all these people walking to and from work. What is that? And, yeah, yeah. You know, here's these uh, uh, Iranian, Russian, and American fans, you know, cheering on their wrestlers here in Grand Central. It was, it was a fantastic event. Uh, and it happened. Um, it happened, if I recall correctly, about a month before President Rouhani's election, and it captured the Sorry. attention mm -hmm. of uh, it captured the attention of, of the Iranian government, the American government. It just came at a wonderful time. Right. And we went after yeah. that. Mm -hmm. yeah, we went after that. Jordan Burroughs, our, our star, and in, in, you know, as far as unity of of the world. And mm -hmm. But you may want to say that the U.S. team has visited Iran at least 14, 15 times yeah. since, since 1998. 1998. Yeah. And Iranian teams have come to the United States at least a similar amount of time. So there is a huge interaction. There is so much interaction going that is becoming institutionalized within both federations. Like uh, in Iranian federations, they got used to the visa process. They know when to start. I mean, institutionalization is so important. And when they arrive in America and Iran, so I think this process of repeated visits back and forth and uh, has helped institutionalize one of the few sport exchanges between Iran and the United States. I don't know of any other program exchange program that is institutionalized this much. Yeah. Well, we, we should point out sometimes the system fails. I remember yes. over the summer there was something called the Kirby Cup they were supposed to come to. Yeah. And uh, because of a worldwide glitch in the US visa yeah. right. issuing process, uh, the visas didn't come, come through in time, sure. and, they, and they weren't able to come. It was supposed uh, to be a one-two punch. We were having them come for the first time um, to Chicago for the Kirby Cup. And then I was taking the first ever all-woman delegation, including a woman coach. I mean, yeah. just all women, and so it completely fell through because yeah. of that. And I just want to. That was an ins that that was not a, p a political decision. That was not a diplomatic decision. That was simply was a technology failing. Yeah. Yeah. The Iranians was, did not believe that. Though. I know. Yeah, yeah, it was really unfortunate. Like but it affected. Um, it affect. It was a global glitch in the issuing systems. We had we had student applicants from Brazil. We had uh, the sports team from Iran. We had athletes around the world. Uh, that were put out by that. It was really unfortunate yeah, that it we, happened. We sent a letter to, to yeah. that federation explaining that, again, yes. that it wasn't you know, anything that, that we created. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one other question I have to ask, and then I'll open it up to, to the audience, and that is, um, by and large, you've had a wonderful experience. But as we know, uh, the Iranian government, uh, or at least the intelligence uh, branch of the Revolutionary Guards, has had a habit of picking up uh, Iranian Americans and also regular old Americans in, in, uh, in recent months. Um, how, how has that affected yeah. the, your program? Uh, you know, uh, do you have trouble sometimes convincing people that they should go? Yeah. In, um, if you don't mind, I'd like to, it, we, we still have a travel warning. Yes, um, it just got reissued. It yeah. just got reissued that advises Americans um, you know, regarding the chance of arbitrary detention and arrest. And, you know, no, we, we mean this is no insult to the good people in Iran and the Rouhani administration, but it is a simple truth that there are people inside of Iran who are opposed to this process of detente that's going on between the U.S. and Iran. Um, there are some who see it as an existential threat. Um, you know, they, 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 they have a perception of the way Iranian society should be, shaped by their own view of what happened in the 1979 Islamic Revolution. And they're using the tools that they have, the intelligence service, the security service, the judiciary, um, to draw a firm line against um, what they see as the unjust encroachment of American influence into Iranian society. We at the State Department, we've seen so much evidence of goodwill between the American and Iranian people. Um, you know, we've had wonderful experiences in ports. We've also been doing uh, educational exchange, artistic exchange, cultural exchange. How many students, Iranian students in the U.S. now? Is it over 10,000? It's over 12,000. Over 12,000 And now. this uh, wonderful 
It's gone, it, since 2003, we had roughly, I'd say about 1,000 Iranian students here in the United States. It's gone up steadily between 20 and 30%. Um, we at the State Department, we've been trying to nurture that. We do student advising programs for free in the Persian language, trying to match a prospective Iranian student with uh, the best American university, you know, the best fit, big mm -hmm. school, small school, whatever mm -hmm. they're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we, we do that. We also have worked to liberalize the visa issuing, issuing procedures for students. And so we've seen you know, a, a 20 to 30% surge every year. Now, and here's, here's the, the cherry on the Sunday. There are only 10 countries in the world that send more students to study here in the United States than Iran. That's amazing when you think of the fact we do not have diplomatic relations. We have not had an embassy there yeah. for 36 years. An Iranian student who wants to study here in the United States has to leave Iran. They have to go interview with an American consular officer in Dubai or Abu Dhabi or Ankara, Istanbul, Yerevan. Um, they need to exit the country, interview, and then go back to Iran and wait for the, the, the result of the visa issuing process. Um, the good news is, you know, more than 12,000 have, mm -hmm. have come here to the United States, and uh, they go back to Iran. That's the other wonderful thing. Um, these students go back to Iran, and now you have 12,000 new students every year with their own firsthand experience of mm -hmm. American culture, of, of, of making American friends, of American society. Um, they're the best uh, advocates for a changed relationship between us and Iran. And, and the best yeah. argument I can think is, you know, the Iranian nuclear negotiating team are virtually yeah. all U.S. educated. Yeah. That's, and that uh, certainly made a difference yeah. in, those, in those negotiations as, as, as well, we A know. fact we love to throw around is that uh, the, uh, the Iranian cabinet actually has Boy. Five, Boy. Uh, five PhD holders from American universities. That's actually five more than the American cabinet. So um, <laughs> it's so yeah it, we, but just to get back to your original question, that may also give you some indication about why those in those inside of Iran who are opposed to this process are feeling a threat. It it has been steady. Um, we've been you know we at the State Department uh, you know these, these wonderful people up here. We have been working for more than a decade to build that relationship between American and Iranian civil society. It's been enormously successful. And there are some now who see the relationship changing and um, they are using the tools that they have at their disposal to harass American citizens. They're not doing it across the board. You know, there are, there are um, you know, the vast majority of American citizens do travel to Iran without incident, but they do pick opportunities and we never, we can never really anticipate what opportunity they're going to seize to harass mm -hmm. um, an American citizen. But one here, should so. say if they're worried about cultural invasion, then they shouldn't pick on wrestling because wrestling is Iranian yeah. cultural invasion of the United yeah. States, yeah. right? Good point. So. But also remember, wrestling is yeah. a traditional sport, appeals to the conservative elements in Iranian society. They're part of the religious class. So in sure. wrestling, it's very different than volleyball, basketball. And wrestling is so much, they start their matches with prayers. Mm. And uh, they started matches with prayers. Most of the logos in the wrestling arena are Quranic logos. So simply by going through wrestling, we are connecting to that important segment of Iranian civil society that we have not connected before because we need to reach to the traditional segment mm -hmm. of Iran, mm -hmm. the segment that is conservative. We go back to respect again. Yeah. I think it is a fallacy to think of Iran as a unitary country that is simply westernized. Everybody wants to have relations. Everybody wants to be happy. There are, there are conservative elements in that society. There are conservative elements that legitimately believe in their conservative principles. Sure. So I think they with- they're here, they too. here too, as we saw. So last I think night. with sports, yes. we have that opportunity to connect across the board without making a distinction between different classes in society. And what I like about wrestling, I like volleyball, <coughs> but I think wrestling allows us to connect to that traditional segment of Iranian society. Uh, if you remember, one of the Supreme Leader's uh, analogy for nuclear negotiation was wrestling. He used wrestling yeah. as an analogy for nuclear negotiation. The Iranian Supreme Leader did that. Sam, it's called it flexible response. Oh, uh, yeah, historic, uh, flexibility. Uh, historic flexibility. Historic flexibility, right. and he yeah, referred yeah, to a wrestler. Yeah. Yeah. So the fact that the Iranian Supreme Leader uses wrestling as a form of diplomacy, again, was really interesting because it shows that in Iran, wrestling is just more than sport. And what I like to see with US in exchanges, we need to uh, encourage exchange programs that reach out across the board, 
not just one segment of Iranian society, which I think bef during the before the revolution, that was a mistake of US. Uh, prior to revolution, we reach out to one particular segment of Iranian society and ignore a larger segment, and that has now uh, have had a reaction. That's a good point. We're going to open up to the audience, so uh, wait for a microphone and <clears throat> say who you are. We'll start with this gentleman here. My name is Josh Hintz, and I'm a former wrestler, former classmate of Barbara's in college. <laughs> I'd like to emphasize or underscore two points that have been made, but not with enough force, that I think is helpful in understanding the situation. First is you cannot underestimate how important wrestling is to the Iranian culture. If I were to walk through the streets of Washington today and ask the people to name the front line of the Washington Redskins, by the end of the day, I would probably have all 12 guys named. If I walk through the streets of Iran and ask them to name the eight members of the Iranian national team, if the first guy didn't get it, the second guy would. And that's how important it is. So they talk of Takti and Habibi in the way we talk of Jim Thorpe and Joe Namath. Mm -hmm. And so wrestling may be the only sport that could accomplish this because it is central to the Iranian character. You look at their legends, you look at their traditions. They earn more medals in wrestling than, than all other Olympic sports combined. Consequently, the implications for diplomacy are as great as it is to do one or two of these, if you had an American culture exchange wrestling teams going over there all the time, you would build a groundswell of support for the American culture that would be absolutely unbelievable. And that's the reason why with Jim Ravenack and USA Wrestling, what they're doing is an extraordinary good start, but to the extent that you want to reach the Iranian people, this is the way to do it. Which leads to my second point which is that I do a lot of business. Some of my closest friends are Iranians. I speak a little Farsi, Chitori. Um, so I understand that if you are my age, um, the average Iranian of my age thinks of America as its close friend. And whereas they may have shut their mouth since the revolution, they haven't changed their hearts. And the way to get to Iran is to allow those people that actually feel close to us an opportunity to do so. And there's no better opportunity than, than cheering uh, at a wrestling mat. So if you, if you do a people-to-people -people approach, uh, which involved uh, just huge numbers of people wrestling together, I can't think of a better way of opening the doors long-term to Iranian society. Okay, appreciate your comment. I have over 1,200 friends on Facebook from the Farsi diaspora. Um, and, they, and these are males. A lot of them are males asking me about my experience of Iran. What would it mean for, for the women of Iran to have these rights? And so they're, it's percolating. And I, I believe it's 65% 60 of the population is under the age of 30. Um, so it's just a matter of time. You know, and I forgot, it was one other example I was going to give about wrestling. When I was in Beijing at the Olympic Games, um, one of the Iranian spectators in another sport walked up to me, and he saw my name tag, and he said, Henson, are you in any relation to the American that wrestled the Iranian in the 1952 Olympic Games? And I said, yes, how did you? No American knows that. But because it was a very controversial match with an Iranian, they all know it. And that's the level of, of love of the sport of wrestling that they have. Wow. Well, Josh, Josh's good point too, though you know the the, the age discrepancy, you know, difference between, you know, you know male and our age and in the the younger generation. I mean, Tehran was, to me, was was a population under 30 years old, and and they were very much wanting to not only westernize but also recognize what's kind of going on in the world and real astute to that. And um, not one time did Kiki myself ever feel you know, threatened at any point in time. And we went That's every place. Opposite. I was embraced over and over again. I was invited to a wedding. <laughs> and then I found myself in a room with all men and I realized, oh, their weddings have, yeah. and, I, and I went. You were in the wrong room. And then I walked, no, 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 they did. They invited me in for cake. And, and I, I said, I'll go to so, the women's room. <laughs> so Josh, I mean, what we're trying to do is get a younger generation to embrace. And, and once that starts, and you know, you've been in wrestling as long, you know, a very long time. To get that going takes time, you know. Yeah. It's, you know, but we just can't just just leave it at Iran. You know, we, we need to do it, you know, for all of us, you know, because it's just a great diplomacy for wor for the world. So. What are the chances that the State Department would support a program like this on a very large scale basis, well funded, and well organized? 
we, uh, good, uh, great question. Because of those concerns that are reflected in the travel warning, right now um, we are reluctant to embrace a large-scale program that sends American citizens into Iran. But we are not going to pull back from this outstretched hand of friendship towards the Iranian people. So activities that go in the opposite direction, that's something we'd, we'd be enormously uh, interested in. Um, but so you're interested in bringing them here? We're interested mm -hmm. in bringing them here, or if there's collaborations that can take place elsewhere in the region. Mm -hmm. um, at present, though, because of, those, um, uh, because of those concerns about the treatment of American citizens, and we realize this is something that could improve over time, and it's something we're going to watch. Um, you know, we're going to, uh, we want, we want a normal relationship like that. We would like to see a steady exchange and a steady engagement uh, between American and American Iranian civil society. We should point out also that the Iran task force that I chaired here at the council recommended three years ago now that the U.S. send some diplomats to Iran to staff an interest section uh, to process visas and to facilitate these kinds of, uh, of exchanges. So we will see maybe after our election, President Obama in one of his final acts in office will we'll just do that, you know? Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> um, you had a question, Warren. We'll go to you next and then, and then to Faye. Thanks, uh, Warren Strobel with Reuters. Uh, you mentioned the positive media coverage of, of your trip. Was there any negative media coverage from the more conservative elements in the press, the newspapers and so forth? And secondly, I'm understanding what you said about the traditional elements of Iranian society. I've been there twice, not as many times as Barbara, but I found it the most pro-American country in the Middle East, yeah. uh, far more pro-American than Saudi Arabia or Israel. And my question is, do you think these kinds of exchanges have any impact on sort of not the hardest of the hard line, but sort of the mid-level decision makers who may be on the fence about better relations with the U.S.? Thanks. As far as the publicity goes, um, there was so much uh, positive publicity. In fact, I don't believe there was any negative publicity that I, um, upon my return, I, I got a message from the State Department saying, hey, well, we'd love to talk to you about your trip. And, I, <laughs> and then uh, along with that, the Brookings um, folks said, we have been seeing your name all over. Who, who are you? And so <laughs> that's... <laughs> So yeah, it was yeah, extremely, I, yeah, I don't think there was a single negative. Well, I mean, I think, again, it depends on the person involved, depends on the project, depends on the character of the whole thing you're doing. I think um, there were, in the beginning, some concerns, of course, and they would come back and, for example, some officials of the Federation will come to us and say, uh, you have to be careful, you need to worry that this sport facility doesn't have any, for example, ladies' room. Mm. And this is only a men's facility. If there is any request for ladies' room, we have to go make extra movement. So you have to be a little bit careful in understanding the situation and not push it. I think some of the backlash comes when uh, many of the visitors, they arrive in Iran, they don't recognize these boundaries that are invisible boundaries. They have these invisible political boundaries. And Iranian government is a factionalized government. So everyone has his own territory, everyone is his own island. And if you just move into one of those islands without knowing it, and for example, then you're taking a chance. But as athletes, as sports officials, we all stayed in one hotel. We went ahead with the program. We, we cleared all the interviews. We didn't want any problems. So if, uh, I was translating for them. And somebody came to me and said, from Minister of Islamic Guidance, do you have a license to translate? I said, why do I need a license? He said, well, you cannot translate for Americans. You need a, they've met me in the lobby of the hotel. No, and I, I told them both, I mean, do you have any problem with my translation? And they, so we had a coffee, and then finally I paid for their tab and left. They left. But I think, I think you have to be aware of this situation. I think when those people showed up with me and said, do you have a license from Minister of Islamic Guidance to translate for these people? Maybe they I thought to, you were a local. Yeah. So I think in a way, uh, I take your point, point very carefully. I think you have to be careful. But I think as long as everything is done in an organi organized fashion, institution to institution, it is much better than individual. When Iranian Wrestling Federation invites them, takes the whole responsibility for them. And they pick them up from the airport, they take them around, and without their approval, she would not be doing interviews. Obviously, they have already checked this, do the interviews. Mm -hmm. And just, you know, uh, 
there's, there's an erosion that takes place as all of this you know, goes forward. Um, we, you, know, you mentioned the virtual embassy Tehran. We, we maintain a very vigorous um, social uh, media network in the Farsi language. Uh, reaching out to Iranians in Iran. When we rolled it out in December of 2011, initially all of our platforms were blocked. You know, they were blocked IP addresses inside of Iran. Now we have more than 600,000 Facebook fans for our USA Dar Farsi Facebook page, wow. um, and 80% of those are inside of Iran. Uh, so it over time it erodes. And and wrestling, you know, as we as you you asked, you know, was there any negative? We watched as, as, as there was overwhelming positive reporting. As we go on to some of the, uh, you know, the, the more traditional, uh, like Kehan and other uh, uh, media platforms inside of Iran, you'd see, um, uh, you know, I, I would suspect they were employees of the hardline elements of the Iranian government, you know, saying, yes, this is all nice, but don't forget the American role in, uh, you know, the Mossadegh, you know, the overthrow of Mossadegh. And you know, trying to get the conversation back to something more negative, right. and they would get shouted down by other users. You know, oh, go away! This is wonderful. That was 50 years ago. This is a wonderful new development in the relationship. Now, that doesn't. We don't even see that taking place. And no. just, um, you know, uh, uh, wrestling really paved the way for sports activities and you know other sports activities that we've undertaken. When we had the um, Iranian volleyball team here. Uh, for a two-week visit as guests of, of USA, uh, USA Volleyball out in California. Um, there, were, there were all sorts of difficulties that took place, and ultimately, um, we, we had to step in more directly the State Department to make sure that all of the, the transportation and everything got, got sorted out. Ultimately, what wound up happening, we didn't set out to do this. I wound up greeting them at the airport at LAX uh, when they arrived, and uh, we decided to take a little bit of footage of that, just welcoming them. You know, we gave them little pins of U.S. Iran flags. They all joked. They said, "You can actually make a pin with both flags next to each other. That's amazing." Yeah. <laughs> um, we put that up on our website, our website that was previously blocked inside of Iran. Nineteen news agencies inside of Iran took that coverage and aired it on their newspapers, on their uh, uh, television stations. Um, we estimated that more than 60 million people saw inside of Iran saw the uh, arrival ceremony of us greeting the uh, the Iranian volleyball team. And on top so. of that, in order to kind of, um, since I hadn't been seen for a little while, um, and yet I, I'm still regularly in their press, um, we rented a ticker tape that said, um, "What did it say? Welcome to the U.S. Yes. Team um, Team Meli, Team yeah. Iran, and um, good luck and good sportsmanship." Signed, you know, Kiki Kelly, USA team leader. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, I mean, Jim also knows that as, as, as uh, late as yesterday or the day before, you received a letter from your Iranian president, Wrestling Federation president, again asking, let's do more youth exchanges. Yeah. I mean, uh, so it, the, right. the, well, when, it when is continuing. We signed the agreement, mm -hmm. you know, we, we had our IF president was there with us. So, you know, that, you know, governing when when President Lalovich is there he represents 180 nations you know we have 110 nations that compete but you know that takes a lot of the stigma out of it because he's a Serbian and you know and he was there to to pin the agreement between US and Iran and you know and facilitate what needs to go on and, and those are the things that we look at I mean it's never you know I, I think that we we probably get more kickback on our side than we do in Iran. You know, we go to go to California, and there's there's a lot of sentiment on, you know, negative on the Iranians coming in to compete with the U.S. So you gotta you gotta be careful on both sides. So, I mean, it's the first sport agreement signed between an entity, U.S. entity, and Iranian entity, and this is during the sanctions, by the way. Yeah. And uh, and Iranian Wrestling Federation is under this Ministry of Sport, is a government entity, and this was the first. Sport agreement that was signed, and I, the 70s, yeah. and I recall USA Volleyball when they came to California, they were talking about this agreement and said, "Wow, that agreement that wrestling signed, could we think we could do it with Iranians?" And they wanted to go replicate it. So this is that uh, kind of a spillover effect. That's right, and they, they signed a similar. They agreement. signed a similar yeah, agreement. Which was wonderful. Came. So once you yeah. do a good agreement, it's institutionalized. You could have a spillover effect. Yeah. Teams will come and say, "Well, could we sign a new one?" Yeah. So I think that was a very positive aspect that another U.S. entity signed that agreement. Okay. Go to Faye in the front row there. 
Uh, I'm Faye Mokhtadur, I'm a uh, Slani Council member. Thank you so much for this positive, uh, amazing discussion. Many of us Iran-Americans were waiting for these uh, historical moments for more than 35 years. Uh, my question to you is, uh, doing, uh, using sports as an exchange uh, to complement our diplomatic relationship, we, we also have uh, in the music industry some iconic uh, characters like Shajarian, Ali Zadeh, who are untouchable by uh, the, this regime, and they have been actually using their uh, musical platform to uh, be even a political figure at uh, special uh, historical occasions in Iran. Have we uh, thought about bringing them and engaging them for, with major uh, musical orchestras in the United States and uh, sort of use music uh, as an exchange to complement a uh, diplomatic relationship? Thank you. Mm -hmm. There's, there, we are actually music. Um, we've actually conducted a couple of musical exchanges. Um, uh, bluegrass musicians and Iranian performers actually get along very, very well. <laughs> um, but we are looking. Uh, we know about the, the Tehran Symphony, um, and there's a number of American symphonies, I will say, that have already been in conversations with us at the State Department about um, mm -hmm. who could be the, the first American symphony to perform inside of Iran. The Pittsburgh Symphony at one point was considering point, it. I'm not sure if they still are Yeah, or it's, um, um, I, I don't think that's live anymore, but yeah, there was a lot of interest there at one point. Yeah. Um, but without, you know, I, I can't say names at this point, but there are uh, at least two or three other symphonies mm -hmm. that are looking at an opportunity to perform inside mm -hmm. of Iran. There is a synergy of music uh, in this last uh, Tahti Cup this January. Uh, Tehran Symphony played inside the wrestling arena. <laughs> and uh, the performance was also, the pianist was the son of the Iranian Wrestling Federation, who is a musician. <laughs> who's a modern musician, and they had Salar Aqili, who is not a very favorable singer, and lived in Canada. They brought him inside Iran, and he sang during this process. Yeah. There is an interesting synergy with music and wrestling. Yeah. Well, don't and forget, when, we, when the yeah. volleyball team was here, yes. uh, the, uh, the Iranian volleyball team, uh, on their last night, got to see Gagush perform in, Gagush in, Irvine, yes. in Irvine, which I thought was fantastic. You know, <laughs> yeah. travel all the way from Iran, get to see Gagush <laughs> in Irvine, which was fantastic. So there but, is an interesting yeah. uh, uh, parallel track here, uh, Iranian musicians, as you know, the art of music in Iran has picked up significantly. Every young Iranian today is learning one traditional instrument. Before, you didn't have any young ladies learning santur, setar, but now I have many, many, my cousins, younger cousins, they're learning setar and santur. So music is a very interesting exchange program as art is also, yeah. we've talked about it. So. Uh, I think one thing uh, that State Department has been very helpful, and hopefully with these new visa restrictions now, it's not going to affect that. Yeah. And maybe we can talk about it. I think we need to encourage more parallel exchanges all together. Have a wrestling event in the evening, have a music. Next day, have an art show. Yeah, yeah. and I would, I'd like to bring some Iranian chefs here yeah. and, and have them cook, too. And then we can have the complete, complete picture. Yeah. Ed in the back, and then we'll go to you. My name is Ed Martin from the Center for Interfaith Engagement at Eastern Mennonite University, and I'm very happy to be here and hear this very positive uh, presentation of the experiences that you've had going both ways. I really, I've also been involved a uh, fair amount in Iran over the last 25 years, and I really think it's so important for more Americans to visit Iran and to find ways to make that happen, because I think there's a lot of positive <clears throat> views of the United States in Iran, and that's because, I, in part, I think, because uh, a lot of Iranians have relatives who live here, and they get a lot of information that way, and there's a lot of information across the Internet. Whereas I don't think Americans have very good understanding of Iran at all, and certainly not of the very positive uh, experiences that er Americans have on visiting Iran. So I would really encourage both civil society organizations as well as the State Department to find ways of promoting uh, ways that Americans can visit Iran because the Americans that I've known that have visited Iran have been transformed. And, and m many of them went there with rather negative views of Iran and came back just loving the, the wonderful Iranian people and the hospitality they received. It's a little embarrassing actually because many Americans um, conflate 
Iran with Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Afghanistan. Uh, they have Iraq. no idea even that it, it, it's, uh, it, the women there wear more trench coats, their, their hair is showing that, you know, they've got the headscarves back there. It, when I was on the bus, everyone took their headscarves off. Um, met, girls and boys are on motorbikes together. It, it's nothing. Like everyone knew every popular song. Um, it, it, it's not Iraq. It's not Afghanistan. It's Iran's very young culture. And very cosmopolitan. Great well, coffee shops too. That's what Valentine's Day is coming up. And it's, yeah, Valentine's Day is almost as popular there as it is here. Yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah. The niceties there are really important. Um, they use tissues. Even uh, everything is so delicate. They don't just use napkins; they use tissues, and you know, every everything is so lovely and, sp and spread out. And we exchange <laughs> flowers and candy and cards and. Uh, Ralph Winnie with the Eurasia Center. A wonderful presentation. It makes me uh, really excited about going to Iran at some point. <laughs> uh, I have two questions. One is when when you were in Iran. Did any of the wrestlers or political people that you met ever try and gauge you in your political views? When I go to China um, for work, or uh, a lot of times people will ask me, well, what's your, what do you think of this particular issue? Not to necessarily put you on the spot, but to understand and relate to you as a person. Also, number two. Uh, Kiki, your initiatives on promoting women, um, how has the IOC responded? Do you see the, them um, working with you and moving this forward and engaging with the Iranian government to, say, bring the World Wrestling Championships to Iran, which hasn't been an, possible because of their reluctance to allow women into, into the Iran? Sure. Okay. To be perfectly honest, it's been, a, it's been my project and Rasul's project. It ha we've had nothing um, from the American side, no support whatsoever. Um, <laughs> no, even USA Wrestling was was, was hesitant. Um, so, but I feel extremely strongly about it. And 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 I, I wouldn't have put myself out there. I have an almost 11 year old daughter. It's not as if I'm out looking for you know to be a hostage. Um, but I, my gut and my heart told me on my first visit that I was safe to stay 10 days instead of four. Um, and my gut has served me right so far. Um, the other question was, they started giving me softball questions because, you know, I'm an American woman and I think they expected Jersey Shore or Hollywood or something. Um, and as soon as, and they, they very quickly figured out, oh, this is an educated woman, you know, who speaks several languages and da, da, da. So the first time I got there, Every time I was interviewed, it got a little more political. And the second time I went to Kiermanshaw, it was all political. They asked me about sanctions. They asked me about US-Iranian relations. They were especially livid still about George W. Bush's um, axis of evil comment. And so I did address all of those things in a very, very, very careful way. Um, <laughs> and, and unfortunately, or, or fortunately, um, apparently my interviews were aired um, at, in, not only during prime time, but, but for maximum exposure. So. <laughs> you know, when, when, they when I get interviewed, the first thing I tell them is I won't answer the question of political. I say, there's no room for political with the sport. You know, the sport is not one to the other. And uh, so they respect that and they don't press it. My caveat was I'm not a politician. You know, I'm here for, for the sport. And the one, the one good thing I don't think any, we're going to have a Iranian woman will be our U.S. Olympic coach for our women's team, Afsun Johnson. She, mm -hmm. um, she was a two-time medalist. She was a silver and a bronze medalist in the, in the uh, 90s, and she retired in 99 because wrestling wasn't in, put in the 2000 Olympic Games, but she was with us in Brazil. Uh, she'll be our first slated coach. So we'll have two women's coaches, but she'll be the volunteer women's coach, and her, her dad was a national a Iranian national champion, and he trained her, and she was she was pretty good. So not a lot of people know that bit of information. She so was supposed to be the coach that 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 went with our delegation of all women. And, and you know, I mean, as far as you know, women wrestling in Iran, it's 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 a long way away, Ralph. I mean, it's it's 
you, you breaking barriers. You're not just breaking a, you know, a, a line of, you know, sanctions. You're breaking a barrier. And uh, it's just take time. You know, it will take time. I'm just thinking with the IOC, there's always a push to They won't get involved with the Iranian, you know, the IOC and then every, every country represents itself. However, um, through, <clears throat> through UWW in Lausanne, Switzerland, um, they had a, a wonderful exhibit, an Olympic exhibit on women who have broken barriers. Um, and I was included in that exhibit. So that, that was pretty important because there was, you know, my picture with the hijab pointing down to Iran. So little by little, these tiny little steps. Yeah, well, you know, we're not politicians. Politicians sitting over there, but no. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and and look, it, it's and those are the things I think that you know, with the sanctions lifting, there's a lot of lot of, you know, the the temperature will ease as it goes, and uh, and it's something that you know, it, it's it's to our benefit to go with it, you know. But uh, you, when when we signed the, the agreement, the next day we met with the president, and you know, it was at breakfast. I think yes. he was with us, mm -hmm. and and Rasul told us that morning. He said, you know, we, we're going to have a women's team, but you can't tell anybody. You know, because he hadn't he hadn't got any clear. Mm -hmm. You know, so he had a lot of political barriers he had to go against, and I think that was one of the things that, you know, every time we turn around, I mean, his job's up on the line because he reaches out there, and you know, and oh, yeah. and there we, are we do our teams in, in in a variety of areas, right? Uh, yeah. Now in Judo. Iran, so yeah, I mean, he you know he's a brave he's a brave soul. I mean, not only was a great champion, he's a great ambassador for the sport. Now, when you get into the heat of the battle, you know, he's he's I don't even think I saw him in, in mm -hmm. Las Vegas. This year. like, where's Rasul? And bad day today, you know, bad day. And then you could never find him. But his brother, Amir, you know, is a vice minister of sport, you know. So you, you, you do carry a lot, of, a lot of ways to go about it. Mm -hmm. if I just, you had asked, you know, did, during these exchanges, do you have any political discussions? And when we had the volleyball team out, they were here for, I think it was 14 days. So. Yeah, we see him every day, you know, for two day, for two weeks. Yeah, you start to, you know, we did start to have conversations, you know, and uh, I won't say who, but one of the players, we really struck up a strong relationship, and you know, and and I, he comes up to me one afternoon, and and I could tell he has something on his mind, and he, we start talking, he starts starts explaining, you know, he's had a wonderful time, and then he quickly shifts and he starts asking me about sanctions, and so I, okay, let's sit down. I tried to explain to him why how we got to the sanctions regime and why we've used sanction and, and try and explain too, it's not what we want to do, we want to move past that and what we're doing right now is trying to create an environment where we can move past that. And then he, he said what I think he really wanted to say, which was, and he says, you know, w when we go to school, he says, every day we have to get up in front of the class and we, we, we give an oath. I said, oh yeah, like, like our Pledge of Allegiance, you know? I said, yeah, we do the same thing in our schools. We say our Pledge of Allegiance. Yes, like the Pledge of Allegiance. And we say all these wonderful things about what it is to be an Iranian. You know, and this, Iran is this, and we stand for this, and we're proud to be an Iranian. He says, we end it with death to America. Mm. And he says, uh, and he just said flatly, we shouldn't do that anymore. And I, I still get choked up thinking about it. I got choked up, gave him a give, good bro hug, and that was it. You know, we were, we were done, but he, he said his piece. And it, it just, I will, you know, for, um, I've been 24 years at the Department of State. That story I'll never forget. So. On our visit to Kirmanshah, it happened to be during the Iranian Revolution celebration. And I had an African-American wrestler. I had a Jewish wrestler, um, of course, a woman. <laughs> and. Uh, Traveling by van, from right? Tehran traveling to by Kirmanshah. van, nine and hour trip. Right through, <laughs> right through the celebrations where you know, death to Israel, death to to the United States. They were horrified. Shortly after that, those um, signs came down. Yeah. yeah and, I, and I did go my first trip to the American Embassy, which I was advised not to do. The old American. The um, and it, it only was I wanted to see it, and uh, you know it, where it was downtown and. Um, you know, Bob said, Jim, you can't go, you can't go. And, you know, and there was some things painted on the wall, but nobody's there. I mean, it's just like <laughs> nobody even goes around it. You know, it's not like they're standing outside. I think that they're more appalled than we were. And um, I just, you know, but I mean, just for my sake, you know, uh, being in the oil business, you know, I worked with a lot of, a lot of, you know, 
colleagues that were taken off the fields in Iran in 79 and literally brought straight back, you know, got on planes, never got any of their belongings. You know, they had to go straight to the airport and leave when all that came down. So. Yeah. Well, they also say, uh, Margbar America Aziz, right? Yeah. Death to the dear America. So that makes it a little bit nicer. <laughs> but also, I think it's important to know that airport, the airport in Tehran has changed a lot because of these exchanges. I mean, that's the first contact that Americans have with Iran when they arrive at the airport. It's fascinating that how airport personnel, when the American team arrives, mm -hmm. some of them have gone and wearing their own presents from the previous visit, mm. the flags and everything, and say, oh, did you bring us a pen? Did you bring us a flag? Yeah, what? We so when we do, I mean, so we have to give everything away at the airport. And the, you, could, you could immediately see that other citizens from other countries who are waiting on that line, non-Iranian, are waiting and waiting. And the Americans are waved through. They're waved through, and Ru they did Russia, that. The Russians I mean, weren't too happy that, that first trip, because yeah. they were waiting behind us. And yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. I they said, I'm not, I'm not leaving sure. without the team because they pulled me out the line and just like, you know, but the Russians, they were getting pretty upset. Yeah. <laughs> so. And it is not because we are the better team. In fact, Iran has every major Greco-Roman skill that we lack. So on, from a team leader perspective, just technically speaking, I want my guys to have as much time with Iranians. When they lose to Iranians, in the, their egos deflate and they immediately go, oh, I, yes, I have to learn more parterre. Um, and that is preparing us very well for this year's um, Olympics. Win-win, as we say. Uh, gentleman right here. Behrouz um, Sadavi, a couple of comments and a question. Um, one is, I don't know if you all remember a few years ago when AI, um, IOC was planning to drop um, wrestling from the list of um, sports and Iran and the US happened to be on the same side mm -hmm. in that one and um, so it was a positive thing in a way you know one of the win win situations there but uh, the question that I have is uh, with respect to other sports um, soccer is a very big sport in Iran. Um, US and Iran have had uh, encounters uh, during the Olympics. Mm -hmm. But are there any plans to um, maybe expand on that one as well? Um, it's a very popular sport in Iran. And that probably is another fertile area that you know, public diplomacy can play a role. We, we've had conversations, you know, obviously soccer, most uh, soccer, football, most popular sport in the world. Um, and, and we've had conversations and they've gotten to the point of talking to uh, the U.S. national team. And it was actually a very funny conversation because, as you know, um, the U.S. national team and, and, and the Iranian team play a very similar style. Very, very. They're probably the two strongest defensive teams mm -hmm. in the entire international community. When I started talking about this with, uh, uh, yeah, with, with the U.S. team, they said, yeah, it's going to be the longest 0-0 game in the history of <laughs> international play. Um, and the reality is... Um, Really, in terms of play, it would be a wonderful uh, uh, it would be a wonderful international gesture. But neither team actually gets anything out of playing each other because they both play the same style of play. So we we kind of decided we'd really be forcing these two together, um, and it really doesn't suit their play style. So what we are thinking about is there is there an opportunity for a club side? You know, Persepolis. You know, would they be interested? We're looking at. Yeah, I mean, we're looking at, at at opportunities like that. It's also very you know. Um, uh, We've loved wrestling and, and, and volleyball because, you know, you guys are ep economical. <laughs> you know, you, and, and, and you're, you take care of yourselves. Um, soccer is expensive. Um, mm. So, yeah, that's, that's the other deterrent. Um, as, uh, as we're all cash-strapped, um, it's hard to, you know. Yeah, sure. Yet another story. Absolutely. I hope you don't mind my little stories um, just to kind of punctuate mm -hmm. these things. But during the World Cup, I make sure that I watch all Iranian sports. Um, and of course, on Facebook and on my text, I started getting pinged like crazy. They were all, um, I was watching Team Melly, yep. And uh, I said, oh, the big red stop sign. And they were so <laughs> excited that I knew that that's what they were being called. And, and so huh. they said, but we're, we're out, but now we're voting for US. And they mm -hmm. did. During the US match, yeah. I got they did. thousands of messages. 
Yeah. yeah, they did well in the last uh, in the last World Cup, and I think it's the first time I watched yeah. uh, a World Cup. I must admit, and I watched them too. Pretty good team. There's been other sports. I mean, uh, Iranian basketball team came to Salt Lake City in 2008. Uh, they had arranged by NBA, and they had mm -hmm. some exchanges there. Um, volleyball is a collective sport. Wrestling is an individual sport. So volleyball appeals to the middle class, to the new generation, yeah. university educated a lot. Wrestling appeals to the traditional class. So one is an individual, one on one sport, one is a collective sport. Yeah. That's new experience for Iran too, to really excel in collective sports. Yeah. So I think uh, by bringing volleyball and wrestling, we are really uh, addressing the issue of sport as the best medium for connection, yeah. whether it's individual competition like wrestling or uh, uh, basketball. I think also the team, an Iranian um, shooting team, came for competition in Ogden, Utah, too. That's right. And uh, archery, archery, archery came. And shooting, yeah, that's right. And Iranian ski team yeah. wanted to come this year yeah. to Colorado for some training. So there's a lot of activities that I think once visits of these officials go to Iran yeah. over there, that accelerates that interest on other federations. Yeah. They saying, oh, maybe it's a chance for us now to go to U.S. And mountain climbing, there's actually, you know, obviously that's a hmm. very solitary sport. Yeah, there's, yeah. there's actually strong collaboration yeah, between course. American mount, mountain climbers and Iranian mountain climbers. They've done, done joint ascents of, of uh, mm. summits in Pakistan and elsewhere. They published so, a book called Rope Diplomacy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. On our visit to Isfahan, um, the person assigned to be our tour guide, mm -hmm. and he did not seem too pleased about it at first, um, was one of their premier basketball players. And that's he thought, oh, I've got to take these to America. You could just see it. <laughs> And within two hours, he was volunteering to oh, spend yeah. an extra couple days with us. We were laughing, and he had a great time. And he's just a you know. And he said, "How can we get basketball and back and forth?" He said he met Michael Jordan. Um, he was very excited to meet us. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Are we yeah. Yeah. It's. Did you have one more comment? Oh, sure. No. Okay. One quick comment. Sure. The laughing and everything. If everybody needs to. Someone said, well, can you come visit Iran next year? I said, well, let me see if it fits my schedule. Let me make sure there's no American hostages at the time. <laughs> now, the Americans were all appalled, but the Iranians were just laughing. <laughs> <laughs> and whenever we find that people that are happier people who truly love Americans, despite what we think, and have this wonderful sense of humor, so when you think of Iranians, think of a great people. <laughs> right. I heard that it's comment earlier. Yeah. They could name their national team, guys. They can na name our national team guys and know where we're from. So, you know, that, that tells you a little bit of something about what they represent in, in the sport. And that's why it's important for us to make sure that, you know, we represent ourselves well when we do go. But it, it's, you know, 25 people know I'm James Ravenack. I didn't wrestle, but they know, you know, with the Wrestling Federation, and Kiki Kelly and even Bobman, they knew that, you know, he was, he was with us with the U.S. team. So. Yeah. Large groups of people going like this and <laughs> for selfies. Yeah. I want to thank you all so much thank for coming and, and all of you. Thank, thank you, God. Barbara. Thank now, you. now you understand why why I like this subject so much. Mm -hmm. I think it's just uh, it's it's a story that doesn't get told often enough. So Thanks. Thank you.